Welcome to Through the Trauma Podcast. My name is Amber Larkins, published photographer, storytelling expert, visual artist, entrepreneur, speaker, and coach. This podcast was born from one question. How do I get inspiring stories of triumph out to the people who need to hear them the most? Come with me, enter my world, where lives are getting changed, heroes are getting developed, and greatness is being achieved. Hello and welcome to Through the Trauma Podcast. I am Amber Larkins, your host, and today I have with me a very, very special guest, Shannon Rizzo. Shannon is a friend of mine. We've known each other for a while. She has an amazing story, but Shannon is really near and dear to my heart because she is she is such an inspiration. She's been such an inspiration to me. And she was one of the very first business coaches that I had. And so Shannon, first of all, thank you so much for being here and joining us today. Thank you, Amber. I'm really delighted to be here and to be able to spend time with you and your audience for sure. Well, I really appreciate it. I know you're a busy lady. You got a lot going on. And the fact that you would spend uh, the next hour with us means so much to me. Shannon sent me the most amazing introduction And I'm going to read it because there's no way I could remember all of this powerful stuff that she's doing. So I'm going to read this to you. And then Shannon, I'm going to open the door, open the floor so you can say anything else you'd like to add. So Shannon Rizzo is a humanitarian and social change catalyst with over 30 years experience as a successful entrepreneur who propels heart-centered leaders into their deepest soul-driven passions, empowering them to create a living legacy of abundance, generosity, and sustainable impact. She is the CEO of Shannon Rizzo Companies, where she consults with conscious leaders, international creatives, and high achievers who want to accelerate their purpose and allow their souls to shine by transforming the lives of others through philanthropic, did I say that correct? (laughs) Initiatives on a global scale. Shannon is also the founder of Boundless Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to breaking the cycle of generational poverty by providing basic needs and safe places to learn, to dream, and to the most vulnerable populations in the the remote villages worldwide. Through their unwavering commitment to education, the Boundless Foundation builds schools that empower entire communities, fosters self-expression, and create a world where dreams become reality for the children and their families. <laughs> that is beautiful. And it totally sums up everything that Shannon is doing. She is a powerhouse when it comes to what she's doing, not only in the lives of others, but just in the world in general. And um, it's truly a blessing to have you with us today, Shannon. Thank you, Amber. I'm just really, I'm sitting in amazement of the platform that you have developed. And this is what I find that's so interesting and beautiful is that so many of us are doing grand things in our lives. And it's not until we put it on paper and kind of take accountability of what we're doing that we recognize like the potency that we each have. So it's my hope that today there'll be some inspiration that's that's shared with your audience that that we can relate to things that are similar together and to bond over those things and propel ourselves together forward. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. There is a power that happens when you you, unite or unite. Is that the right word? I use Um, it and unite. So I think it's both unite and then it's like. (laughs) Right. It's powerful. It's powerful. This is why masterminds work. This is why coaching works. This is why we get together with like-minded people because we can thrive on each other's, um, you know, we can downplay the weaknesses and thrive on, on the things that we excel in. So such a blessing. I'm so excited to have you here today. I'm excited too. So all of that to say, this lady is doing amazing, amazing things in the world, but everybody has a story. And Shannon has a story. Shannon is, she's got such an amazing heart. Um, And, you know, it's funny. I was just chatting with someone earlier today about how we can use our failures and the things that's happened to us and our experiences and really use that to propel us and take us to 
these extraordinary levels in the world. And I truly believe that you have been, you know, a representation of that, being able to take the things that have happened, has happened to you and been able to use that kind of as a driving passion. But I know we want to get into the conversation as to kind of how that all relates, um, how you've used that. And um, so we're really excited to get into your story. Do you want to tell us anything specifically about yourself or you want to jump right into talking about kind of where it all began? Yeah, I think a little bit of both. I feel like really what came up for me when you were just talking about just this really powerful heart that we have, the biggest thing for me, uh, and I'm realizing through just the the experience of become, you know, being on your podcast is like that the connection, the human connection is really what it's all about for all of us. And it's so, it's so beautiful to be ready recognized to have such a big heart or a connected heart. And so I really just appreciate that compliment. And that is really the truest form, I think, of what human beings are looking for. It is to be loved and to be seen. And I hope that through this podcast and talking about the stories, I mean, we all have trauma, we all have survived it, and we all are in this place seeking that love, whether it be you know, for ourselves, that self-love, um, or for others, or to be receiving in relationships that make us feel fulfilled and just safe. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's really where my story starts is to look at, um, you know, my struggle started when I was just a child and wasn't feeling safe. And I think that that's where a lot of us are uh, at some point in our life, if not at childhood, then definitely in our adult lives as we we learn and grow through things that happen to us. Yeah, I definitely think that's one of those kind of pillar things that um, there's a lot that goes into when you don't feel safe, it prevents us from doing and acting and achieving and and really becoming the person that we're supposed to be. Um, how do you see that? How did you see that kind of manifest in your life through not feeling safe? Yeah. Um, such a powerful question. I think that it, it's, I, I discover more about myself as we all do. If we're, if we're in that healing process, every single year, I look at what does safety actually mean? And it wasn't until this past year that I really realized the repercussions of not feeling safe my entire life. So regardless of my circumstance, I do recall a brief time just a couple of years ago when I looked around and I had everything. There wasn't anything I lacked and I still didn't feel safe. So it's all, I kind of wanted to put that perspective on this, that when I tell my story as a child, it's through a child's eyes. And it's also the story of me that I, I saw through my own picture. It wasn't my mom's story or my dad's story or any teacher's story. It was just about what I was feeling and where I was. And so painting that into this vivid, vivid, vivid picture of uh, where it started was as a child, my parents divorced. And, you know, at three years old, I, it was, it was very traumatic for me to, to, to lose my, my parents, you know, being together. And I don't even really understand that looking back, there's many, many stories of things that happened that I have even blocked memories for a large part of my childhood, because it was too much for me to handle at that time as a three-year-old and a four and five and six, seven, eight, you know, there's a big gap of time there. Mm -hmm. And every now and then these memories will resurface. But what's most important is not about the actual things that happened when, when that was occurring. You know, there were times when, um, you know, I have memories of living in a car with my mom briefly and not having enough and not having those basic needs. And when I think about that, it's not about my mom or what she was able to provide or where she was in her life. It was about the feeling and connection that I had with her during that time. And what happened was I became a child of empath, an empathic child that looked and observed and watched. And I, I remember feeling what she felt during those times, but I'm only a child. So I'm only still using the skills that I have as a, as a child. And so as I grew through these experiences, it really affected me because I didn't understand that that was only one way 
to live life, right? So I'm, I'm observing her, I'm watching what's going on around me. We moved a lot. And so I met a lot of people and that, that also comes full place into what my gifts are. And so I'm really just so grateful for the experiences that I had because these things that happened that were trauma, they did transition and transform my life into the beautiful gifts I have now. Mm -hmm. Um, But that period of time, you know, what I learned was that I'm a survivor And I come from a line of survivors and I'm resilient and I come from a line of resilient women and that these things that happened and occurred were just circumstantial, but they weren't who I was and it wasn't who my mom was. So moving forward just a little bit, you know, my mom moving, always trying to better our lives. I watched her do that. I watched her meet, you know, a man that she fell in love with after the divorce and they really together partnered and develop this life to pull us into a better financial circumstance. And so that's kind of where the story begins. And just so much happened during that period that that really set the time. Oh, so there's obviously a lot going on there um, and a lot you took from it. And I think that so many times people have a hard time really kind of placing their finger on it. I know I recently shot a video of my story And in my story, it come down to me when I tried to analyze it come down to this thing of validation. Like I've always kind of struggled with this form of validation. Um, So I think when we're able to put our finger on kind of that defining thing, what is that? It opens up a lot of doors and it answers a lot of questions for us. So do you think that these things, do you think, do you see a similarity in the things that you started to see develop as a child and being able to use that as your driving force in what the things that you're doing now? Yes. It wasn't until a couple of years ago that I noticed that that was a thread that ran through my life. And it took me having these conversations with my mom you know, like I'm I'm doing this thing and I don't, you know, I don't really understand it. And she'd say, well, Shannon, you know, you, you did love school. Like you did love to be in school. And I thought, well, why did I love to be in school? Why am I building schools right now? Why do I think that's a safe place? What is going on with that whole thing? And when I go all the way back, I remember that that was the consistency that I had, that that was really knowing that I would show up to a location, one of the 17 or 15 that I went through before I graduated high Mm -hmm. school And it didn't matter how many of them I went to, there was a structure and there were teachers that were there ready to give you knowledge that could basically help you do anything you wanted to with that knowledge. And so I became a sponge, not only at watching my mom and my dad at home and really trying to observe what they were doing. There was a lot of discussions about finances and not having enough and and what they were going to do when they did. And like, so I kind of saw those things happening. But being able to go to school and get that attention, um, reading these books and then asking questions and having them answered, I really began to kind of see like, this is safe to me. Having information makes me feel safe. And like, it just blew my mind that something so incredibly, it seems small, but it was the information from watching human beings interact with each other, you know, the tangible, you know, the, the, the speaking, the touching, like all of the things. And then it was going to school and being able to read and then to be able to read people and then to kind of sum up my surroundings and to be able to navigate. What happened was that thread of having to change schools all the time made me a powerful friend. I was able to connect with people almost immediately in these new circumstances, I could, my mom would say, there wasn't anywhere I couldn't take you and you didn't find a friend. And she said, I told you to quit, quit talking to strangers. Cause I'd love to just start up a conversation with a stranger. And this is me at a a very young age. And she, you know, kind of reprimanded me for it. And then I said, Oh, this person is not a stranger. This is Bob. And like, I would introduce her to the person because I thought, well, if you know their name, they're not a stranger anymore. (laughs) (laughs) And so When I look at my life now, this is the thing that people say about me. They're like, Shannon, you're so genuine. You're so authentic. And you really do love to talk and have conversations with people. Well, it's, it's what came from 
this moving, right? This, this constant resilience of, of getting from one place to another and then meeting new people and gathering information. And so looking at the safety factor, that's really the thread is providing safety. You're going to need education. You're going to need information. And that's kind of where I see that, that coming into my life now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, I believe, and I have this thought and this theory that like, you know, the Bible says that everything that happens is, um, used for our good. Um, and I truly do believe that. I believe that it's perception. We have to perceive that it's that it's good, even the bad things, because those things can be used as something that's beneficial. Even the failures that we have, the things that are in the moment seem really bad, but then in long term, looking back, we're like, whoa, that that wasn't so it was bad that that happened, but it's propelled me in this direction. And I can see areas in my own life and in my own journey where that's happened. Um, so there comes a point in one's life, I feel like, where you have to look back and reflect and say, you know, I'm not thankful that all these things happened. But on one side, I'm not thankful. But on the other side, I am kind of thankful because it has made me who I am. And I wouldn't be doing the purpose thing that I'm called to do if I had not experienced some of these things. And it does also make you a very much more relatable person um, to those who share that, the same type of experiences. So as things progress and you get a little bit older, at what point did you kind of realize, like, I need to take all these things and push them into this driving force? Like, at what point did you really discover your purpose? Yeah, I, I think it was about three years ago. So it hasn't been very long ago. I, I'd always been making moves and taking things, but not really understanding why. So all the things, like you said, they all added up. And I just kind of felt like I was a reactive person. I would set my goal or my dream on something and I would just leave, I would leave it alone. And I didn't know that that was really embedded in my heart and my soul. And like, that was my purpose. And every time I would go towards it, it could be what the trauma that came from is that there was many failures. There were many that I thought that I was going after something and I would fail. I mean, I'm not doing anything small. Everything I did was big. And so the failures were enormous. And I remember thinking at one point, you know, I caught myself. I woke up one day. And I was in the shower and I was married at the time. This is, you know, 15 years ago about I was married and I was in the shower and I just remember praying and I didn't pray often. My relationship with God was not very strong at all. But this moment in this time, I, I was in the shower and I said, God, I really need your help. And I don't ask you for much. Probably this prayer has been said by so many millions of people over, over lifetimes, billions and I just need to know from you, like, I don't feel like I'm in the right place and I don't feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing because this is very painful and I'm suffering. And if you chose this for me and this is what I'm supposed to be here to do, then I will do it with the best of my might. I will change to right now and I will regain my strength. And if it's not, I really wish you would give me a sign because I'm apparently very dense and I don't get the signs you've sent me already if you've been telling me that I'm in the wrong place. And what I looked up to realize is like, why was I saying that? Why was I in the shower at that time? And what was happening around me when I said that? And it was all failure. It was every bit of my, my marriage was not good. It was, we weren't speaking to each other for weeks on end, which is not who I'm, I talk all the time, every day. I'm like, for me not to be speaking to somebody, it's gotta be really bad. Mm -hmm. um, and it, what it was is I didn't wanna hurt him and he didn't wanna hurt me. So it was out of love, but it was really distant. And we had sold our business. One of them we had closed down because he was so sick. He had a chronic illness and I had taken care of him along with 55 employees. And, you know, it was a logistics company. So it was a lot of information. You say, so a blessing, right? I love information. It was way too much. It was mm -hmm. a lot to handle. We had, you know, trucks and employees all over the United States and, and you know, in some other countries. And it was it was taxing me to the point where I had lost myself. I had lost the connection with my heart. I didn't know who I was. I was waking up every day like a zombie. 
And I felt lifeless. I felt like my life force and my vitality was gone. And I was only 30 years old. And it really devastated me to think of like, what have I created? What have I done to deserve this? Like, what did I call in? And I just thought it's got to change. At this point, I can't go on another day like this. Mm. But seven more days passed after that incident in the shower. And my husband came home and he said, I'm just not in love with you anymore. And I want a divorce. I fell out because even though I had said it, I don't think I understood what I was saying. And there was the answer. He was letting me go. I was being freed to have another choice again. And it was devastating, but I knew I had asked for it. And I said, okay, I will listen. I'm not going to avoid this one again. You've given me clearly what I've asked for. And so I went through the motions, went through that. That was a devastating experience. And there were a lot of details that I won't share, but it, it was it was highly devastating. It was a hit like I've never taken before. I thought we would be together forever. And that was that. Mm -hmm. And the recovery from that took years. Mm -hmm. It took years. But I went to the court, you know, basically filed the divorce papers. And that moment, I felt this huge expansion. I was sad, but I was also like, I felt this vibration of now it's time. And so that is where the momentum started to build of like, you've got to get yourself back together. You've got to get well, your, your health has to come back. You've got to start taking care of yourself. You have to get ready because you're about to be delivered a message that you, you need to be ready for. And so fast forward a couple of years, it took me. I, and that's when, you, when I met you, basically, I had come through that and I was on the end cycle of that three-year period where before I was, I was, you know, after the divorce, it was alcohol. I was eating. I was laying around. I wasn't doing anything. I didn't know what to do. I was crying constantly for three. I think I cried for three straight years. And then all of a sudden I, it snapped. I went to the gym three times a day. I started eating well and no alcohol and just really started to depend on my relationship with, with God. Like, how do I get through this? Show me how to get through it. And if you ask him, he will tell you, this is something new. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that so is- I met you, I met, I met Whitney, I met Brittany. And so th- the series of people that came into my life, I could have never imagined why they were there or who they were and why they were going to be part of my story. And over the next year, I found myself in such an, in- an incredible, impactful movement, I'll say, because I found myself on a private island with other wonderful human beings and entrepreneurs. And then I found myself on a plane going to the middle of a hurricane to save people who were needed to be rescued, who were in massive poverty and had lost everything they had, which wasn't much and, and helping on a rescue team. And this, this span of like poverty and wealth was just this beautiful ticker that was in my awareness. And so I started to notice that everything in my life had pivoted to this point where I was able to understand and be the bridge between poverty and wealth. And so that is where my purpose kind of lies still is in this, how do you bridge the gap and help people who are in poverty, who, even if it's a poverty mindset, even if it's that they have the things, but they don't feel that they have them or they really don't have them and then help the people who do have understand how much they can impact and help by giving. Mm. And by what they receive in return, it's not just about the money exchange. It's about the heart expansion and the connection that they will feel. And so I noticed that even having that transportation company that was killing me, I would never have been able to go into developing countries in the middle of nowhere with the confidence and uh, grace and understanding and awareness had I not already had all of those skills that were developed And even in my relationship, understanding the human heart at such a a beautiful capacity of such pain and suffering, and then having the opposite, which I have now is a heightened love that is is more than I could possibly imagine. And if it wasn't for these things that, that happened to me, I would never know the bliss of the other side. That's so powerful. And you know, there was a a book when I first started like my entrepreneurial 
journey, I would say. Like, you know, I come out of a divorce where um, I, I had a business, but it was more like a side gig and just for fun. When I come out of my divorce and I started trying to make that into a real source of income, um, one of the first books that was recommended actually by Whitney, um, our mutual friend, um, was Visioneering. And mm -hmm. I thought this was a business book. And I'm like, okay, let me read this. It has a, it comes with a very strong Christian background, but it's, there's so many nuggets of truth in that book where he talks about this idea of everything in our life, even the things that seem completely irrelated to what it is that we are doing or what we're called to do, or, I mean, even down to, you know, mopping floors or whatever for a job, you will take those skills. Every single thing is directing you into your destiny and you're taking skills from every one of those things necessary skills that you're going to need for your calling. And my, you know, I read that book. It made sense to me. It stuck with me years later. I still remember that part of the book, but there's this thing that comes with embracing these things too. Like this is who I was. I made a lot of bad decisions in my life, but in God's grace, he's taken those things and he's allowed me to use even those mistakes that I've made to be beneficial in the things that I'm doing today. Um, so it's it's really a beautiful thing. And I love that you've touched on this and that you've kind of brought this up because this is so powerful for people to hear. Now, I have a, I have a question for you and I know the answer already, but I want to hear you say this. Like I'm how- being set up. <laughs> <laughs> I want my listeners to hear you say this because- um, how important is perception and how important, what role does gratitude play in this? I have chills on my legs thinking about that. The, um, the most important vibration and frequency that will bring you the connection to spirit that you need, that will bring you closer to God is gratefulness. And so if you're listening and you can't hear him, it is because your state of gratitude has not risen to the point where he has opened that channel wide open for you. And it is the, you know, I told you I came from that place of I didn't pray much and I didn't really talk to him. And when I, when he, when I did, it was the bargaining thing. I was always like, if you'll just do this one thing. And it was never a state of gratefulness until the moment when, when I saw what I asked for. And I said, Oh, and now I'm supposed to be obedient. And I didn't understand before that moment, what that meant. And I had to practice. It wasn't, it didn't come natural. It was a practice for sure. But the, the gratefulness frequency is how we manifest and bring in what we want. That is how you get to, to live your dream life is by being grateful for what you already have. And it's one thing to say that. And so for, for, or the people who are listening who are like, yeah, I am grateful for everything I have. It is, it is really a state of mind and a state of being. And when I say that, I'm actually positioning myself. You can see me moving and my, moving my hips and sitting. To be grateful and to be in that frequency, you have to be able to receive and to know that you're receiving. And so for so many, it's that, it's that radical responsibility that we haven't taken yet. We haven't been able to to really say it's all about my perception and what I'm doing. It has nothing to do with anybody doing something to me, for me, without me, with me. It is all about your state of right now with your source. And so that is, that is where it comes from. And that perception of gratefulness opens wide up the light to be able to come into you and to leave you. And that is the true connection of love. That is self-love. That is love from our God. That is, that is what everything that we desire to be a collective and a human, human being with another human being, like this beautiful, beautiful collection of people that we are to be connected so deeply is all about gratitude. And when I, I used to hear people, and so I'm going to take, take it back a step when I didn't know what gratefulness was. And I thought I did. 
but I would wake up in the morning and I would do those three grateful exercises like, oh, I'm grateful for this because I woke up and now I'm awake. And then I'm grateful because I have all my toes in my fingers and I'm grateful because I get to work from home. But I didn't feel it. Like the feeling of it is the state that I'm talking about and bringing yourself into complete presence. It isn't even laying in bed and doing that. It's actually standing up and grounding your feet on the ground. And then if you need to sit and have your spine erect and really be in the, the, the honor, the honor of yourself and your presence and your connection with God, that is the gratefulness that I speak of. And so the perception part of that is if you perceive that your dreams are far away and that you desire them, but they're just, you're something you yearn for, or you deserve it, or, you know, there's so many words I can put on that. And I don't want to offend anybody by saying those words, but it is kind of something that is kind of provoking that we need to talk about is, you know, when you feel that you deserve something, there is not gratefulness in that space. And so that is kind of the example if you find yourself saying, I should be here by now, or I should have these things by now, you're putting a time limit, first of all, on what your plan, what the plan is that he has for you. And then also on yourself and you're, you're actually kicking yourself down a notch and not giving yourself enough credit because the thing that you think you deserve is probably the smallest thing on the list because what his plan is and what we have to do in this world as human beings is so much bigger than you can possibly imagine. And if you haven't opened that line of communication, you'll never know what it is. And so we get caught up, we get, you know, the task driven, I've got these things on my goal list and I wanna check it off. If you don't look up from that and you don't say, what is it that I need to surrender to today? Then you cannot have the, perspe the perspective of gratitude and that really being able to receive the message because they only come to you when you can look up and see them. They're not on the floor and they're not behind your eyelids. They are 100% an expansion and up mode. And mm -hmm. so I really, I'm so thankful that you, you brought that up. There was a book that I did read as well, um, The Surrender Experiment. And before I read that book, I had already said yes to a year of yes. And the year of yes came right about that time I talked with you about when we, we first met. I thought nothing in my life has gotten me what I want before now. So I'm going to say yes to all the opposite things. And this was not something that was new to me. I did it when I saw my mom do something or my dad do something. I'm like, well, I'm not doing that. I'm doing, I'm not, I'm going to go way over here and do the opposite of that. It's I can't just go a little bit in the gray area. I'm just going to go all the way over. So it's like all or nothing. So I applied that approach again, but everything that I would normally say yes to or no to, I said, yes. And everything that I would normally say yes to, I said, not right now. Mm -hmm. And that changed my life. That one thing, if I could leave them, if I could leave the audience with anything else, everything you're saying yes to, take note and ask yourself, is it something the divine would want for you? Or is it just something that you want? Mm. And the second thing is, what are you saying no to? And are you so close-minded that you can't even hear or see what's going on around you to pick up on those small little signals or the little trail bits that you're being left to lead you into the spot where you're supposed to be, where happiness and fulfillment and joy and love are. Yeah, man, you just said a whole lot of things and that was amazing. Like that was so good. And I even said some things that I've not heard explained that way. Um, <clears throat> I agree with you you know, when we talk about this, when we talk about gratitude, um, gratitude changed my life and it changed my perception of life. And I truly believe that it is, it's like, if you believe in God, then he is our father, just like I am a mother to my children. I'm a parent. And when I give my kids, you know, I take them for ice cream and then they complain, <laughs> I didn't want this kind of ice cream. It tastes old. It's freezer burn, whatever. I'm like, I drove my car, gave you ice cream. Like you didn't even say thank you. You just said, you just complain about the ice cream. You know, there's like all these instances and it's so hard to teach a kid this, but I look at us as human beings and I think this is exactly how we are. 
until we get to that place of gratitude and what makes us believe that we are going to be blessed with things more when the things that we're given, we're not even grateful for. We, we catch ourselves and it's a hard mindset shift because for me, it was when I was transitioning from my normal innate self to this super power person. I wanted to be extraordinary. I didn't want to be ordinary. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be the very best me I could be. And when I started embarking on that, this idea of you, you don't even realize you do it. It's a subconscious thought. It's like, ah, my day is terrible because da 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 da, and you name off all the things. And it's like, hold on, I'm complaining. <laughs> and do you, do you think Amber, that that became a badge of honor at some point in our lives? Like, I feel like coming from where I came from and growing up in and around the adults that I was around because the time frame they grew up, that it became a badge of honor to complain. Like my life is harder than your life and I made it and I'm fine. And I'm, you know, they're not fine. Like they did make it, but they're not really fine. But they, they actually would, would talk about this. I, I noticed it was in a lot of people around me that that became like, my day was harder than your day. And it was like a competition of whose day could be worse than the other person's. And that's when I realized that I had to change who I was around. And that would, that was one of the hardest things that I ever had to do was to, to just part from people that I love so very much and not spend as much time with them because I knew that they were not going to be able to pull themselves out. And I didn't have the strength to help pull them out of where they were. And so instead of us all suffering together, I chose to have pain temporarily and to stop relationships that I, I, the worst thing in the world to me is leaving someone to abandon them because that's fears I have of my own about being abandoned and to have to do that in order to, to survive and thrive. My stomach hurts even thinking about it, but that's one of the hardest things I think that we have as humans to be grateful for is that we have choice. That's huge. Yeah. That we have choice for sure. Um, I also, I can feel your pain. And I think a, a lot of people, you know, they, they say that you're the product of the five people you're around the most. And when you have made the decision that you are going to change your life, you have got to change things. You've got to change the people you're around. Um, and, and also when you're going through something that's extremely painful or hurtful or taxing on you. When I was going through my divorce, I had to distance myself. There was people and it was like, every time I'd get on the phone with them, it was like this just like pile of things they were complaining about. And I'm like, I cannot, I just, I, I don't have the energy. I barely have the energy to take care of my kids and shower. <laughs> like I'm falling apart. <laughs> I don't have the energy to hear about your bad day or your food that wasn't right at lunch or what, whatever. Yeah. I don't have the energy. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I think that's okay. And I think as people are listening to this, you know, if you are caught in this where, you know, you need permission, it's okay to put those boundaries in place. In fact, it's encouraged to put boundaries in place because the first person that you have to take care of is you. You can't take care of other people if you're not in a good mental state, if you're not in a powerful place mindset wise. Um, you know, and I feel like sometimes this is the culture that we see. I, I can't really relate to like the that error of like when our parents grew up or I don't I know things have changed, but I can relate to the fact that we are I I think there's a lot more awareness. Um it's there for the taking for those who decide they want to take it. I feel like too, the one thing that you said that is really, you know, we talk about choice and that sort of thing. And, and the advice that I would also love to share is there's a statement that I came up with that helped me through that time period. And I, 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 every time I have to make hard decisions and boundaries about where I'm going to spend my time and who I'm going to spend it with, because evolution of our, our soul is inevitable. 
And so we are always going to have to do that. It's, it's practice for when you do it six more times, you know, because as you evolve, not everyone around you is ready for that. And it's okay. They don't have to be, and we don't have to force them into changing because we're changing. But the thing that helped me the most, and this was even with my clients, I even publicly stated with my clients at the time, this was a couple of years ago, I'm no longer going to pull you along. I'm going to invite you. And that helped me so much because I wasn't leaving anyone. I was just transforming and evolving at a rate that seemed suitable for me. And I didn't want to punish anyone for that. I didn't want to be punished for that. And so for me, that statement was like my savior because in my eyes, I wasn't responsible for everyone around me. I was only responsible for me and how I acted and how I conducted myself and what made me happy and where I went towards. And so I remind myself of that quite often. I'm not leaving anyone. I'm just inviting them to come and they have the option to say yes or no. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And you'd be surprised, Amber, how many people say yes because they miss you and they, they, they start to evolve with you. It's mm -hmm. not as fast normally as we'd want it to be, but they do come along. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, there's, there is definitely that. And then also I'll say this, and I've seen this happen and I'm curious your thoughts on this as well, but there's this idea as well that we, I have my calling in life. You have your calling in life, the things that you're supposed to do in this world. And when we have these callings, Sometimes people are aligned with us for a certain amount of time, and then maybe we don't align as much anymore. So we have to, it doesn't mean that there's any personal infliction against that person. It's just that we align for a time and we can still pick up the phone and call each other and, you know, talk like we've not missed a beat, but maybe we're not as close to that person as we were because our missions and our, our, our goals, our alignment is not the same. And I think that when we can get to the place of being okay with that and knowing, you know, as long as you align with me, let's do this thing together. But if at any point we start to misalign, you go do your thing and I'll, I'll be here in your corner and I'll go do my thing and you be there in my corner. It's powerful when we can get to that place. I'd love to know your thoughts about that. Yeah, I, I think that that's 100% true. And it is a practice that I have as well. And I always want to be uplifting everyone around me who is who is trying their best to do their best, right? So it doesn't matter who you are, what you're doing. I want to be a part of cheering you on and helping you with whatever resources, because I've gathered a lot of resources over my life. Like that's the thing I do is I'm like, I'm a resource hoarder. And then I want to share them with everybody. So sharing is a huge part of who I am. And I think that the, the challenge that comes with that is the other part of that is when people, when they do find fault with it and when they do accuse you of things like disappearing or not being present for them or not being there for them, this is their own wound. And this is where things kind of can get a little bit tossed and feel very much pain and trauma can, can come from this. And so it's because they have something in their past that has hurt or wounded them and they may or may not be aware of it. And that's when this separation or this, um, you know, just this guide of like, we're just going to go our separate ways for a little bit. And if it turns out we're back together, that's wonderful. And if not, it's, it, that's a very conscious state of mind. And it's kind of in the same realm of gratefulness, right? When you can hit that gratefulness mark and you really are conscious about the, the ways that you end or, um, you know, take space from relationships. That's a very mature way to go about it, but not everybody in our life is available for that. And they're not yet to the point where they can understand what's happening. And so it may go back to a childhood wound that they've suffered from, or even a recent relationship wound. And that's, that's really where, you know, professional help comes in. Um, you know, you and I both have sought out professional help. And that's another thing that I can say that's really important if you're listening is you're not meant to do it alone. <laughs> like this is, this is not easy and it is a constant effort and continual growth and continual processing of pain. And so one thing that both you and I have done, I, mine personally, I sought a life coach. That's what pulled me out when I said, I just snapped one day and got to it. 
I had made a phone call to um, a person who's my friend right now. And uh, at the time, I didn't know her. I saw her once. I heard that she was a life coach. I had no idea what a life coach even was. I, and I was a little bit like my parents came from the thing. If you had a therapist or a psychiatrist, then there was something wrong with you. So I never would have thought about professional help. And I just got to the point where I was just exhausted from being exhausted. And I'm like, I'm just going to call. It says it's free. I'm going to call her and get on this uh, discovery call, I think is what she <laughs> called it. And I, it was a 30 minute free session. And within five minutes, I was talking to her about my, my spare bedroom. This is how unaware I was. I'm like, the spare bedroom in my house is an absolute mess. I just closed the door. I can't do anything with it. There's just a bunch of stuff in there. And then when I look back at it, it wasn't even really that disorganized. It's just, that was my perspective. Right. Mm -hmm. And she started to ask me these questions that made no sense to me whatsoever. And they were about my relationship with my ex-husband and the things that had come up. She's asked me about my eating and like, what am I putting in, in my body? And I'm like, what does me eating a salad have anything to do with my room being disorganized? And it had everything to do with it. And within five minutes, there was a breakthrough. And I was like, oh my God, I've not been able to get a schedule back since I divorced my husband. And now I'm a disaster because X, Y, Z. And I just, it clicked. It was like all triggered from like, I hadn't accepted that I was divorced and that I was single. And so this room represented all, all the old things. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is it. I need help. I know I need help now. I signed up for her package right away. I'm like, she's the person for me. Not only did I go through a series with her, but I also, other healers came in, spiritual guides came in and coaches for business. So she, I ended up following her through a coaching practice. I ended up being a coach because she transformed me in five minutes. I'm like, this is beautiful. If I could ever do that for someone, I would want to do that. And here I am today doing that. So it's just incredible that we, we have to seek help. If we are stuck, we have to reach out. We have to ask questions and we have to get ourselves, ourselves unstuck. That's our responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I, I've said it before on, on this podcast and I'll say it, I'll sound it from the rooftops, but I honestly believe in having a coach for every area. If you are looking to grow in whatever area you're in, if you want to grow, if you want to grow your fitness capabilities, lose weight, gain weight, gain muscle, whatever you're trying to do, if you want to do that, it's not to say that you couldn't embark on this on your own, but the amount of time and effort and energy and the frustrations and the mindset shifts, it will it happen? I don't know. Um, I right. personally love having a coach in every area. I love when I'm trying to grow my business, I like having a business coach. When I'm trying to get in better shape, I love having a fitness coach. Um, you know, I, I truly believe there's, there's power in all of that. I know when I was growing in my spirituality, like there's power in having mentors and coaches in that. It's so valuable, but I don't know that everybody sees the value in that. I think it's hard to see, especially if your finances are not where you want them to be. And this is the thing that's resonated with me over the years is that it has cost me way more money to not have someone help me with the shortcut to get to where I need to go than it was with paying the coaching fee. And this is what really has resonated is that when you start with a program, just asking yourself to qualify what it is you expect from it is really important. So asking what the outcome should be for yourself and then knowing what that is and that value that you're having to, to decide it's upfront cost, right? You're like, okay, this program is $1,200. This one is 5,000 or 10,000 or whatever it is. And you're like, that's a lot of freaking money. But my question is, what if you don't, how much are you going to spend making messed up decisions? I can tell you tens of thousands of dollars of decisions I've made in business. If I didn't, if I had had the consultant that I have now, I would have never made. I, I can tell you, I, quant, I actually quantified it um, three weeks ago, and it was $170,000 in the last five years that I would have saved by hiring her, and she's $30,000. And I'm like, that would have been a no-brainer if somebody told me up front that I was going to make all these decisions and these mistakes, and it was going to cost me this much. And then I'm looking back at how much time I missed with my family or my friends. It wasn't just about the money. 
It was about the stress that I was under when I made those poor decisions. And also I wasn't present. And so it cost me birthday, you know, events that I missed or friends that were doing something and I could have been spending time with them. That was really the biggest thing for me. And I think about these connections and that's what I'm deeply after. And that, that decision to not hire a coach cost me connection. Mm -hmm. And so I look at that now with a completely different light. And I have, I have four coaches right now, right? Because I want the support. I need the support and I value the connection with the right person who's mm -hmm. going to coach me through that. So I think that's important to, to know is that you do know inside yourself when something is right for you. It's when you start talking yourself out of it that you have to watch. I can honestly say this, and I've spent a lot of money on coaches, a lot. I figured it one day and I was like, whoa, <laughs> all yeah. the things I could have had. But one <laughs> thing I would have missed out on, and even the coaching programs that I have invested in that has not been as good, you know, like maybe I didn't get a lot out of them. They have all played a huge part. And looking back, I wouldn't have done it any other way. I honestly would not have. Um, I'm a coaching addict though. Like I yeah. love having a coach <laughs> um, and there's times I have to cut myself off. I'm like, okay, Amber, like trust yourself. You can do this, but, yeah. um, <clears throat> Same. <laughs> but you know, this all comes back to intuition and it takes a certain level of being able to like tap into those areas to know that to trust that you truly can make decisions. And sometimes that comes from having someone in your corner, having someone coach you through certain things. Um, but it has totally revolutionized, rev made revolutionary the way that I think. And yeah. so it's, it's been huge. Um, so, and, and I just want to bring this up too. Like you said about the stigma that's, that's attached to therapy, to, you know, to coaching or to getting help. Um, and I, with my, with this podcast, with my heart, I want to normalize that. Like, let's normalize those things because I personally think everybody needs a coach. Mm -hmm. I would not know what I know today in fitness. If I had not worked with several fitness coaches, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't know what I know today. Let's normalize that. And if you need, if you're in a dire situation, a bad place, a, you know, toxic thoughts, and you can't shake them thoughts of suicide or thoughts of, you know, drug use, or you're addicted to, to substance or whatever, we should normalize getting help because the world needs every single person. You're here for a reason. There's no, that you're not a mistake. Yeah. And, the world needs you and it needs you to show up as that gifted, powerful person that you are and you were created to be. Anyway, I'm well, and you can be a on my soapbox. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's true. And, and you could be a missing link to someone else's happiness as well. So like, that's the thing that we're not considering is we can't look outside of ourselves sometimes and we need someone as a coach to reflect that on us. So that's one thing that's very powerful that my clients always tell me is that, you know, Shannon, you can see something in me that I cannot see for myself. And that beautiful process of, of showing them their own light and just reflecting back to them, what you, what, what I see in them has brought, has transformed dozens of people in just a couple of sessions. And so it, it is, it's that, that they hold the space for you to grow into because you, in your area where you are right now, you cannot see it. And so some people are capable enough to hold a space big enough for you to grow into and support you while you're doing that. And then you'll go on to somebody else once you outgrow them. And it's just a cycle of life, like, like some relationships, right? So, so beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's to normalize it is, is absolutely necessary. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to encourage everybody to just step into that, that purpose and that calling and that place that you're supposed to be. Cause you know, the world really can be a beautiful place if we, even with all the bad stuff that happens and it still can be really beautiful if we change our perception, you know, the little things, the gratefulness, like you're saying, the little things, if we can make ourselves aware, you know, when my daughter gives me a kiss on the cheek or, um, you know, the, the, how it feels when I brush through my hair, you know, like little things, it's like 
once we tap into that, it's true power. And it's like a whole new world starts to open up. It's a, it's a frequency. And so what you'll notice is when you have that, you start to smile more and that smile like exudes gratefulness out. And, and one of my moments today, just to show how small it can be, like just what you said, brushing your own hair, I opened the refrigerator today. And because of, because of my past, I have a really big thing with food. Like having abundance in food is very important to me. And my partner knows that he takes very good care of me. The food in the refrigerator is always beautiful colors and different things, but he cooked uh, chicken last night and he, he left a little piece for me um, in a little container right in the, the front of the refrigerator. And when I opened it up, I didn't know what I wanted to eat. And I saw that sitting there and I was like, wow, I'm just so thankful that he thought of me and put that right there in the front. And now I get to have, it. I don't have to think about anything. And it just made me like dance around the kitchen. I was like, mm -hmm. you know, and it just, it's like a little chicken. That's, that's all it took is to make me that happy for hours, hours. And it's, it's that, like, I could have also looked in there and looked and saw that there was nothing else in there that I wanted to eat. And it's full of food, right? So the perception is, that one little piece of chicken and all of these other things, I just can't find anything I want. Look into your closet. You don't know what you, you don't you just can't find anything you want to wear and you have beautiful things in there or some of your favorite things, maybe you only have five and they're five of your favorite t-shirts that you go to every time you want to put them on. Like being grateful for that, like that you know that you have a favorite, like small things. And that mm. starts to spiral into bigger things, you know? Yeah. Having a neighborhood that you live in or, you know, having air conditioning when it's yeah. hot outside. There's so many things we can be grateful for. Yeah, for sure. Gosh, that's so powerful. So Shannon, I know we, I've kept you a long time today, um, but I do want to ask you this. What, like, what would you recommend to people? Like say that someone is struggling. I know we've talked heavily about coaching, but is there anything else that you would kind of recommend resources? You said you're a resource person, like where would you send someone who might be dealing with some of this, maybe some childhood trauma, maybe some of those things that attaches to us, shame or fear or, um, you know, these different feelings of loneliness or abandonment, or if those things are really screaming out of our heart, like what? Do you have any recommendations for someone who's listening that may be struggling with some of these things? Sure. And I'll also give you some in the show notes as well. I, I do have some free things that I actually offer to my clients and I'm happy to extend to the audience. And they are, it's a kind of a check-in to see if you do need help or not. And uh, the other part is a phone call um, with me. They can have the phone call and then I can direct them to the resource specifically that I know of, because I do have so many, it's hard to just give one or two, not knowing what the actual challenge is. And I don't want to send somebody on a, a chase of like, is this for me? Is it not? Cause you're already potentially in a confused state anyway. So having that connection and really sitting with someone, I'm just really happy to have a 15 minute conversation and, and give them the resource list um, could be links or healers. It could be you know, therapist, and when we have such a huge network of people to help. And so I would love to just extend that and I'll give that to you for the show notes as well. And then also just really, I think putting, putting your hand on your heart, if you're listening to this right now, it's for a reason and asking yourself, do I need support? Do I need help through something really difficult that I'm going through? And if you feel like the answer is yes, chances are tears are going to come. And that's when you need to reach out that moment, not waiting, not saying I'll do it tomorrow, but just going ahead and taking one action towards the support and safety that you need to get reconciled, because that is when you are at your, your most vulnerable. And it is important that you connect with a human being. And so, you know, we can go down the, the, the free things and do the journaling and all this stuff. But really it's important that if you're, you're feeling like you need support to find a human being and tell them. Mm -hmm. And this podcast is a great place. I've, I've looked at the resources in the notes that have, from each one that have been offered. And there's a great selection here, right here that you've provided Amber. So know that, that you are doing something super incredible by providing these talks with, with experts in their field. And then this list that you're gathering as well. And so reach out to a human. Yeah, gosh, that is so good. 
That is, that is really good. And I, you know, I want to definitely encourage people like stay tuned because there's so many things um, that people like myself, like Shannon and some of the other people that I've had on, like we live through certain things that I feel like could offer value just as, you know, it, that's what human nature is about. We go through it then we help other people through those things. And I can promise this, I've seen it in my own life. And I think Shannon can probably attest to this, but there is power in being able to walk someone else through your trauma and there's healing in that. Yes. And so I just encourage, you know, if you're at this place where you're feeling a tug on your heart to share some things, share them because there's power in that and healing as well. Absolutely. And, and that's the thing we I actually call that the epic exchange when you're giving out something and what you receive in return is so much greater. And it just creates this beautiful um, synergy between two humans that it's, it, it does, it, it creates an energy of movement and transformation. Thank mm -hmm. you, Amber. This has been delightful. Well, Shannon, thank you. You are such a pleasure. I know you and I could chat for hours. We have done it before. <laughs> we have to cut each other off, but, um, but thank you seriously so much for coming on in and just sharing all of your expertise. You have invested in me so I can invest in other people. You know, you were the one who really started um, my journey into real entrepreneurship. So, um, you know, and that's, that's like you said, the natural progression, you're seeing it right here. So thank so you. Beautiful. For Such an honor. Thank you for listening to Through the Trauma Podcast. If you have found value in this episode or believe in the mission behind what we are doing, please subscribe so that you never miss any future episodes. Also, be sure to check out our Transformation Project at transformationthroughtraumaproject.com where we help inspirational stories get heard on a larger scale through multiple platforms. If you know someone who can benefit from this episode, please share it with them. Until next time.